If that's the reasoning, then I'm fine with it. If someone says, we've done the research, we've got heaps of feedback from teachers to say that year one students can't, can't read time, it's just too hard for them, too conceptually, it's too difficult for them, fine, let's go ahead with the change. But to arbitrarily change, if it's being done arbitrarily, then someone needs to interrogate it. G'day teachers, my name is Peter Price. I'm the co-owner of Professor Pete's Classroom. In this video, I'm going to do a review of the consultation curriculum for mathematics for year one. You can get, find access to these documents in uh, the ACARA website, but I've prepared documents that you can read along with if you wish to. Um, I'm presenting it as a PowerPoint file, but also I'd save it as um, PDF in case that's more useful to you. So we're going to look at the year one consultation curriculum and compare it with the existing 2010 cu curriculum. So it's been around for 11 years. It's probably time for um, a revision. And the car has made a lot of very small changes. There aren't any major structural changes. There are some fairly big movements of content to different year levels. But apart from that, it's more of a tweaking than anything else. It's adjusting the language. It's adding some explanation that makes things clearer. Sometimes gaps have been filled. Sometimes gaps we didn't know we had have been filled. Um, but that's the sort of nature of it. I've prepared what I've called an executive summary. The biggest change here in year one is place value. And I'll say the same thing about the year two when I come to that video. Place value has finally got a place, no pun intended, in the year one curriculum, as it should do. Children have to know that the numbers are base 10 numbers and they are governed by this system that we call the place value system. The biggest gap, the biggest thing that used to be in the curriculum but isn't now for year one is telling the time. Students used to have telling the time in year one and now they don't. It's simply just not there. It's been moved to year two. So that's a fairly significant change. As a summary of the year one curriculum, it's been expanded. It's got added content descriptors. Four of them didn't have equivalent content descriptors in the old curriculum, so that's significant, especially in measurement. And the addition of place value is a huge improvement, as I already indicated. Looking at the content descriptors as a, uh, in a tabular form, you can see there used to be 15 of them in the 2010 curriculum and there are 16 in the 2021 curriculum. As I said, there's a lot of changes are fairly small changes. You can see how they are lined up with the various topics. Um, they're divided up differently now. So um, in the old curriculum, we had number and place value as one subcategory, substrand, followed by fractions and decimals, money and financial mathematics, patents and algebra. The, the first three of those are now all part of just number strand and the last one is part of the algebra strand and so on. So there's really not a lot to look at except to see we can see some numbers have moved slightly. That's really not that significant. I put the table together to see what the changes were and I guess it indicates, as I said before, they're not very significant. Now content descriptors have changed a lot. I'm talking about the code that's used to um, designate each content descriptor. In the old curriculum, it started with the three letter code, ACM, Australian Curriculum, Mathematics. The new one is AC9M. As I said previously, I don't know where the nine came from. Someone's decided we needed a nine. I don't remember seeing numbers one to eight mentioned anywhere, but anyway, there's a nine there. So AC9M, then the old curriculums had a two-letter code for the strand, number and algebra is NA, and then a three-digit code, 013, for the uh, numbering of the content descriptors. The new ones have a year-level code, which is important. So it now has a one for year one, two for year two, and so on. And the number strand has been separated from algebra, so the number strand is all on its own with a capital N, and then the numerical codes start with 0, 1, and for the rest of the number strand for year 1, they're incremented 
So there's number one, number two, number three, and so on. And then when you get when we get to algebra, it goes back to number one again. So I think the numbering is a lot clearer than it used to be. Let's look at the first content descriptor. In fact, it's the first two. They have been combined to form the first one in the new curriculum. We've got recognizing model, read, write, and order numbers to at least 100. So it's number study, locate the numbers on the number line. Then recognize, describe, and order Australian coins according to their value. So I'll just quickly explain the, the color system that I've in, in, introduced in these slides. The orange text represents text that was in the old curriculum and doesn't appear in the new curriculum. If I've crossed it out, then I believe that it's been removed completely, so the, the idea behind the text isn't there um, at all. The blue text represents new ideas or new text that's been added into the new curriculum, and the black is what is consistent across both versions. So I'm, I'm hoping that you'll find it useful to um, see where the changes are that have been made. This first number content descriptor in the new curriculum, it's combined aspects of the two old uh, content descriptors that you can see on the left. So it's all about studying number, recognize, read, write, and order numbers to at least 100. The new curriculum includes the word natural, so it's specifying natural numbers, which from memory is whole numbers that are positive in value. So it doesn't include, it's not integers, it doesn't include negative numbers. Natural numbers to at least 100. Represent them using physical and virtual materials. That's important and it wasn't there. It did say model in the old curriculum, but the new one says represent using physical and virtual materials. It includes money in this same content descriptor. It used to have its own place, as you can see. Now it's been in subsumed, if you like, under the number content descriptor and number lines and charts is a new one. So there's quite a few changes that have been made here, but nothing terribly significant, I think. Let's look at the, the second one. This one is completely new because you can see on the left hand side of the screen, there's nothing there in terms of an old um, content descriptor. The new one is recognized that two digit numbers are composed of groups of tens and ones and can be, can be partitioned into other number groupings. That's place value. Okay, tens and ones, two digit numbers, place value. As I said before, this is a very positive change in my view, and it was something that was sadly missing from the old one. Moving on to the third number content descriptor, we can see there's not a lot that's been cut out of the old curriculum. It said count collections to 100. The word count has disappeared, but everything else is there. And it's been significantly expanded under the new curriculum. Quantify larger sets of objects to at least 100 by partitioning collections into groups and so on and so on. Uh, continue content using knowledge. I put it, whatever that Latin indicator is pronounced as sick. Uh, there should be a comma there, a car. Place value and skip counting, recognizing that the last number said in the count represents the total number of objects. So a lot of expansion of what we mean by counting and its place in the curriculum and what it is we're trying to do as students study numbers up to 100. Of course, this will be combined with the place value previous uh, content descriptor. So um, I can't speak highly enough about place value. I think it's absolutely vital that students learn that. Let's move on to number four. Here we're looking at simple addition and subtraction problems. Uh, they've changed the word represent to model. The old one included counting on partitioning and rearranging parts. The new one refers to a range of strategies. So it doesn't specify the strategies. I don't know why that's been left out. I guess you can expand it and the teacher can choose other strategies. Solving problems including one digit and two digit addition and subtraction, that's good. It specifies which size the numbers will be. Using physical or virtual materials, diagrams and a range of strategies. So it's really expanded to um, the explanation that's given to teachers to know um, what approaches are being favored. This is a quick overview I have to insert here, and um, I don't have time to expand 
enormously on what we're doing, but hopefully you're getting the idea of the changes that are made. Number five, there is no equivalent under the, under the old curriculum. We've got modelling situations and solving problems that involve equal sharing and grouping using physical or virtual materials, including money, diagrams, counting or sabotaging to find the number in each, each share or the combined total of the groups. They've left the language out, but that's really talking about multiplication and division, which is interesting. Um, but the idea that we're going to do problem solving specifically and that we're going to model the situations that are um, the subject of the problem solving is very, very positive and very um, welcome addition. Um, the, it, one of the focuses that I think maths needs to have, no matter who's teaching it and at what year level, is that it enables us to solve problems. So by putting this up front and specifying to teachers that this is about problem solving is a very, very good thing. Moving on, here we have an old uh, content descriptor which has completely disappeared, recognising and describing one half as one of two equal parts of a whole. The fractions idea, it's gone. It's gone to year two. So that is a significant change. My view in questioning whether the change is a good change, whether we would agree with the change or not, is largely built on our knowledge of how well students cope with the content. Um, it's all very well to say we could teach anything to any child, as one researcher um, was said to claim. But in real life, in a real classroom, some children just won't get the ideas. And sometimes there are some ideas that are just too advanced for the majority of students to understand them. Um, I'm happy to see fractions move to year two. We used to do more on fractions, common fractions, that is, um, in the younger grades, but it's gradually been shifted upwards. So I suspect this is one of those things. Um, then we move on to recognising, describing and ordering Australian coins. We looked at coins before, that's been moved to number one. And we'll come back to that because both of those are now mentioned in other places. But um, this is the way the curriculum has been organised in terms of um, explaining the parallel content between the old curriculum and the, new, the proposed new one. So some of this has gone into number, which we already saw, and some of it's gone into space, which we'll look at as we come to it. So that was, that's it for number. We're now going to look at algebra using the code 1A for year one algebra. Uh, the old one included the phrase develop confidence with number sequences to and from 100 by ones from any starting point. I'm disappointed to see that moved. Counting is a low level skill and counting in sequence really doesn't develop very much. But the idea that we would help students to develop confidence with number sequences by ones from any starting point is a pretty important one. However, it has been decided to remove that. Skip counting by twos, fives and tens starting from zero, that's still there. Investigating and describing number patterns formed by skip counting and patterns with objects. So that's clearly part of the same idea. They are um, combined into the one algebra content descriptor. The second algebra content descriptor for year one is completely new. It doesn't have a, a parallel um, old version. So it's recognized, describe, continue and create repeating pattern sequences with numbers and objects. It's, it's a detailed description of what students will do regarding patterns. I think that's very important. It's very valuable addition. And it, it explains in clear detail what it is that students are to be um, instructed to do with patterns. So I'm in favour of it. Let's move on. We're going to look at measurement. So the 1M content descriptors, uh, year one measurement. The first one starts with the old curriculum, measure and compare the lengths and capacities of pairs of objects. All of that content has been moved across into the new curriculum, but it has been expanded significantly. Measure and compare objects and events, so that's new, using familiar attributes, including length, 
mass, capacity, and duration. So they've added mass and duration. So it expands the range of things that we're going to ask students to do. The significant change here to me is duration, that we, we didn't have time as an attribute or something that could be measured, um, and now it is. I think that's a good change. I think that's, um, it's important that children learn the idea of measuring time. Although it's not a physical attribute, unlike most of the others that we measure, it's, it is a very, very important one. And it includes order objects and events using direct and indirect comparisons, communicating reasoning for strategy. So there's lots more content that can be done there that can be expanded dramatically to make new activities and new lessons um, for the year one students. The following measurement content descriptor is um, on its own. It doesn't have an, um, a parallel in the old curriculum. Recognize that units need to be uniform and used end to end for consistency when measuring. Explore informal ways to measure, compare, and communicate the length of objects using informal units. That's all good stuff. So this is expanding on a basic idea of, or a basic principle of measurement that you need to use consistent units. The units need to be uniform and used end to end for consistency when measuring. It's particularly talking about length, of course, where you, if you're measuring by feet, you, lengths of feet, I mean, um, you would put them end to end without gaps and without overlaps, all that sort of thing is very, very important. I found students were pretty sloppy with measurement when I first uh, started teaching it. Um, and I found I had to be very, very specific about accuracy and doing it carefully and properly so that you can, um, you, you got some meaningful result. So that's a, a good addition. Then we move on, the, the next, the third measurement content descriptor. In the old curriculum, it was describing duration using months, weeks, weeks, days, and hours. The new one expands on that, keeps all the same text, but it compares sequences and cycles of events, describe their duration using familiar units of time, including, and the years have been added, years, months, weeks, days, and hours. So again, very useful. Um, I see no problem with um, that change. Then we come to an old um, content descriptor, as we might call it, which is tell time to the half hour. It's disappeared. It's been removed. It's now in year two. I tend to think that year ones could cope with telling time to the half hour. They're five or six years old. I don't think it's too early to help them to understand how you can read a clock and find out when it's half past two, for example. Even if it just said tell time to the whole hour, I'd have been happy with that as well. I think it's a mistake to remove that. What do you think? I'm very happy to be corrected by experienced year one teachers who might say that, no, it was, just, it was always too difficult. If that's the reasoning, then I'm fine with it. If someone says, we've done the research, we've got heaps of feedback from teachers to say that year one students can't can't read time it's just too hard for them to conceptually it's too difficult for them fine let's go ahead with the change but to arbitrarily change if it's being done arbitrarily then someone needs to interrogate it um, before we move on and you know set it in concrete so that children in year one are not, no longer learning to read the time i think it's a mistake i really do off the top of my head Moving on, we're going to look at space. This, of course, is part of geometry. The space strand has to have a two-letter two code, SP, um, because we also have statistics. So statistics is ST, space is SP. So moving on, we're going to look at the first of the space content descriptors. This comes from two previous content descriptors. The first is recognize and classify familiar shapes and objects using obvious features. And the second is recognize, describe and order Australian coins according to their value. Now we came across the coins one before, according to the way it's explained and set out in the proposed new curriculum, the new space content descriptor relates to both the number strand and the space strand. This one is a bit strange, so I'm going to unpack this a little bit. The new content descriptor says recognize, compare, and classify familiar shapes and objects. So far, that's good. We've got the word compare added. Nothing wrong with that. 
But if you look at the previous version of this uh, equivalent content, it used to say familiar two-dimensional shapes and three-dimensional objects. Now this is a common change across the whole of the proposed new curriculum. They've removed all the, the mentions of two-dimensional and three-dimensional, referring to shapes and objects respectively. I think that's a mistake. Two-dimensional shapes doesn't perhaps add anything to the meaning of the word. You could say it's a tautology, it's a shape, it's two-dimensional. Yeah, maybe, but I find, I have found over the years that I myself have been confused about what is, which is the best word to use. Is it shape or is it figure? Is there, are there things that are objects, you know, are objects always three-dimensional? I think it just clarifies it for the teacher if you say two-dimensional shapes and three-dimensional objects, it neatly separates two-dimensional geometry from three-dimensional geometry. It separates the, the shapes and the objects that we're referring to, and they need to be separated. I think by putting them in there and just saying familiar shapes and objects sounds like they're eh, pretty much the same thing, different ideas of the same thing, I don't know. It's a mistake in my view that those words should be put back in, two-dimensional shapes and three-dimensional objects. Now we come to the, the second part about describing Australian coins. This has been linked to this new space uh, content descriptor, but I can't see coins mentioned because they're not. And it says classify familiar shapes and objects in the environment using obvious features. I guess they're saying that's the coins. The coins are an example of a familiar shape and object. In, well, it's not a shape because that's two dimensional. It's a familiar object in the environment and it's got obvious features. Fair enough. I really don't understand why it has to be mentioned specifically in the space. Perhaps I'm reading too much into that. Let's move on. The second space content descriptor um, it used to say give and follow directions to familiar locations. Now we've got give and follow directions to move people and objects to different locations. It's almost the same thing. It's um, specifying that we're going to refer to moving people and objects, and it's taken out the word familiar. I guess that means you can give students examples of questions where it's not a familiar, lo familiar location, but it is about location. All right. Probability, just the one content descriptor to look at. And you'll see there is no colored text on this slide. That's because the wording is identical. No changes have been made. I'm happy with that. I think that that language is entirely appropriate. Identifying outcomes of familiar events, the language that should be used, will happen, won't happen, and might happen, are all very appropriate for year one. So let's move straight on to statistics. There are two content descriptors, I think. No, there are three content descriptors in this um, strand. The first one, we have choose simple questions, and then all the rest of the text has been removed. The new one says explore different types of investigative questions used to collect data, discuss the type of data they produce and the sorts of decisions that could be made. There's a missing bracket, Akari, okay, you have to put that in. Okay, so it's expanded the idea of using questions to collect data, and it's taken out um, making inferences and gathering responses, I think that's a, um, a positive clarification of what's intended. And then we move on to the final two. These come from the same old content descriptor, re represent data with objects or drawings, where one object or drawing represents one data value and describe the displays. The new ones are acquire data and record in various ways, including objects, images, drawings, lists, tally marks, and symbols. So see a big expansion in the language there, the vocabulary that's used, and it mentions digital tools. And then secondly, represent collected categorical data. And again, there's a lot more detail here about what we mean by the data and what sort of data we're collecting. Using one-to-one -one displays, including pictographs and tally charts, using digital tools where appropriate, quantify and compare the data using total frequencies and discuss the findings. So masses more detail for teachers. Um, to me, that's always a good thing. 
And this is redundant, but it's it's not redundant. It's very, very useful. A teacher browsing the curriculum to say, what is it we're supposed to be doing here? will find it helpful if the curriculum gives them the language and gives them lots of verbs to say, we're going to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And that's all important. I'm just going to make one more comment before we finish this last slide here. And that is this idea that we use digital tools where appropriate. A lot of places in the new curriculum, the proposed new curriculum, the words with or without digital technologies where appropriate have been left out in most places. Here we see it's being added in. We've got acquiring data and recording, blah, 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 using digital tools where appropriate. I think that's redundant language. I think if we just, you could have a blanket statement at the beginning of the syllabus that says we're going to use technology, we're going to use digital tools where appropriate, and then specify what you mean by where appropriate. But to arbitrarily, well not arbitrarily, but it feels arbitrary to insert it in some places like this and then take it out of others where it would have been usefully left, I really don't know. I think the curriculum writers should decide, are they going to remind us again and again and again that we're going to use digital tools where appropriate, or are they not? I Really, I don't mind either way, providing it's understood what is the approach to digital technology. Otherwise, we run the risk of saying, use digital tools here, 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 and here, and then we're silent about the rest of them. Does that silence indicate that you shouldn't use digital tools? Probably not. Considering we've got computers and laptops and iPads and digital everything, digital watches even, around us everywhere, the idea that we're going to use a digital tool is not a stretch. It's not something that should surprise anyone. It certainly won't surprise teachers. Teachers are quick adopters of technology to make their job easier. And they should be quick adopters of giving tools to students that are appropriate for them to do the maths that they're learning. So um, I've talked too long already on this video perhaps, but I think it's important that the, the curriculum writers get their act together and decide whether you have to keep on saying, and we're going to use digital tools or not. I tend to feel we don't need it. We'll, we'll figure it out. We're going to use digital tools. It's like we're going to say, and you'll use a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker. We're not going to say that. So why would you say, and we'll use digital tools? Who knows, there could be a new digital tool introduced tomorrow that you didn't think of for a particular um, content descriptor and lo and behold, you should have said something about the digital tool. So to my view, leave it out. So that's it for the year one review of the consultation curriculum. I hope you found some points that you agree with. I hope you found some that you perhaps don't agree with. Either way, I'd love you to leave a comment below this video. If you'd like some more help in considering the questions of, that I'm raising on this video. Um, I've got some documents that I'll happily share with you for free, uh, PDF and PowerPoint versions of the slides that I'm looking at on the screen and that, that I'll overlay on the, on the video um, that you could use in a classroom setting, a school setting. So you could um, easily have a um, professional development activity where Teachers are asked what they think of their particular year level curriculum and the changes that are there. I will point out that the ACARA, the body that is the publisher and is responsible for publishing the Australian curriculum, has asked for reviews. They have asked for feedback. Let me just find the document. The feedback period, there's a window of opportunity to let Akara know what you think of the curriculum and that is from the 29th of April until the 8th of July 2021. This is, has to be signed off by the Ministers for Education from all the states and territories and the federal government in time for the start of the 2022 school year to be implemented from then. So if you've got any thoughts at all about what you think of the content that's in there now, you must put your hand up and uh, go to the website and put in your comments. They've asked for comments from teachers, principals, education specialists, parents, and the wider community. So they're taking them at their word. They are asking us to tell them what we think. So I encourage you to get involved in that process. 
Please let me know if you like this video. Leave a comment if you would. And don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to see future videos of this sort. I'm finished talking and I'll talk to you again next time very soon.